Good morning. The Lord be with you. So First Presbyterian Church wishes to welcome all of you to worship this morning, whether you're here in person or online. And if you are visiting with us today, please um, fill out a visitor information card. It's an orange color card in the visitor or in the pew in front of you and then place it in the offering plate later in the service. Also, if you would happen to have a prayer request, we, I know we say this every week and you probably know the drill, but if you have a prayer request, Grab a prayer request card, fill it out, and put it in the offering plate um, at the appropriate time. And we will get, Steve will get those. Um, announcements. There's a picnic following worship today. You're all invited. Are there any other announcements? Oh, Carol has one. Yes, please everybody come over to the backyard at the manse after church, and we're going to have a lot of fun. There's a, a photo booth props and photo booth stuff so you can take your own pictures. Um, also, just a reminder about the Progressive Dinner on July the 30th. The sign-up sheet is still out there, so uh, if you haven't signed up yet, which I don't think I have yet, so um, join the club. Go ahead and sign up as soon as you can so that we can get things kind of organized. Thanks. Are there any other announcements? Wow, short announcement day. So take a moment to share the love and peace of Christ with your brothers and sisters. May the peace of Christ be with you all.
Thanks. Remember, remember this was the thing that everybody was mad about during Corona? There's no big surprise. Look at that. Everybody's still social distancing. All right, Maestro, hit it. Dave, hit it, Maestro. <laughs> So let's enter our time of worship in prayer this morning, please. Join me. Holy triune God, as we come together this morning, open our ears to what you would have for us to hear. Open our hearts to your will for our lives. May our worship this morning and ministry be honoring to you and transformative to us. Amen. And now join me in the call to worship. It'll be on the screens. We come together to worship. An act of spiritual unity and joy. We come together to praise. A time of gratitude and thanksgiving. We come together to live a life of fellowship and service. Let us worship God. And let's begin again. Our, just remain standing for our opening hymn. Number one, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Please be seated. Who among us has not been enticed and led astray by idols? All of us come with a need to confess. Let us do so with trust in God's endless desire to forgive. Please join me in the prayer of confession that will be on the screens. Let us pray. Loving Lord, we long to be your faithful people. But our good intentions run out, and we come up empty. For all the ways we fall short in our sin, forgive us, gracious one. Change us like water into wine. 
to become what the world lacks, that our community, our nation, our church, and all creation may know your justice and love. God has lifted you up from all that has pushed you down. Gone are old names of derision, forsaken, desolate, nobody. Through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, God calls you by new names, wise, knowing, faithful, healer, prophet. Hear, believe, and trust your new name. In Jesus Christ, my name is forgiven. So at this time, I would like to have Miss Olivia Wayne come down front, please. It is um, with great excitement that um, we get to present to Miss Olivia today. She is receiving the Carol Halliday Scholarship, the Dr. Jack Persinger Scholarship, and the Charles and Lucy, Lucille Ellis Scholarship.
And on behalf of your church family, we would like to present that scholarship to you with a Bible from the church. Thank you, sweetie. And I guess now the kids can come on down. Make a lot of noise, Hannah. Maybe we can have some older friends help out. Maybe. Anyone? Anyone? It's just you and me, girl. <laughs> I bet they're being very helpful. Uh, I used to work with kids, so, yeah. Come on down here with me. <laughs> right there. There you go. So, what did I bring with me today? A newspaper. And a newspaper helps us keep up with what's going on in the world, right? So, what can I find in here? Ads. Yeah, they want to sell us stuff. Cartoons. I forgot about that. Boo me. How about sports, weather, some good news, some bad news, all kinds of stuff in this newspaper. Well, it made me think a little bit about how um, the Bible kind of reminds me of a newspaper because it gives us reports of things that happened a long time ago. And so today, I thought we'd read our story kind of like it was a newspaper article. Are you game? Okay. So as I'm flipping through here, I see, hmm, interesting. Here's an article that says, man attending a wedding turns wine, water into wine. Water into wine. Hey, I must read about this and find out what's going on. So let's pretend that this is the Jerusalem Times, and I'm going to read our Bible story today. It comes from the book of John. Here's our article. On Tuesday, a woman named Mary was in Cana to attend a wedding. A large number of guests, including her son, a man named Jesus, also attended the wedding. Guests at the wedding were reportedly having a good time until the host ran out of wine. At that point, it seemed that the happy celebration might turn into a disaster. Some of the wedding guests thought that perhaps Jesus might have a solution to the problem, so they reported to him that they were out of wine. When told about the problem, Jesus at first seemed unwilling to do anything, but after some encouragement from his mother, he finally agreed to help. Eyewitnesses at the wedding reported that Jesus noticed several large water jars nearby and instructed some servants to fill them with water. After the jars had been filled with water, he told them to dump some of the water out of the jars and take it to the man in charge of serving the wine. When the wine steward tasted the water, he discovered it had been turned into wine. Wedding guests were amazed at the turn of events and said that the wine was the best they had ever tasted. As a result of this miraculous event, many people are following Jesus everywhere he goes, and many believe that he might even be the long-awaited Messiah. <gasps> what a story! Turned water into wine and the best wine they'd ever tasted. Sounds like a miracle to me. Not magic, because magic can be explained. There's a, an explanation for it. But a miracle, mm, 
that's something special. So the good news is that Jesus performed miracles over 2,000 years ago, and he's still performing miracles in us today. If you let him, he might even work a miracle in you. So let's say a prayer. Dear Jesus, worker of miracles, work a miracle in us today. Amen. This I'll pass it out candy. So we're calling people to come forward, even if you're not a kid. You can move. <laughs> So today is our Doves and Kisses Day, uh, where we're celebrating all parents, whether it's our parents, whether they're here with us or no longer here, or if you're a parent, we're celebrating you as well, but all parents. So the kids and our helpers are passing out little treat bags of doves and kisses. So this is our way of honoring all our parents, kind of picked a a happy medium between Mother's Day and Father's Day. So enjoy. Our first scripture reading this morning will be a responsive reading. It'll be on the screens here in just a moment. It's Revelation 19, verses 6 through 10. Um, And if I remember correctly, what you will be saying is in italics. So this screen, you will not say anything on this screen because it's going to, oh, it's in yellow. Thank you. Okay. I couldn't remember how I did that on the thing. So it'll be easy to tell. So here's from the vision of John in Revelation 19, 6 through 10. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, Write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship, but he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. 
Well, I, uh, uh, I got these shirts, these priest shirts. I got them when I was ordained, and it was a gift from the church I grew up in. And somehow, since 2000, June 2007 was when I was ordained, and somehow between then and now, my, the collar got smaller. <laughs> so I wanted to prove to everybody, I had it in, I tried. If you want me not to fall over and pass out, I'm going to take it off. All right. I did want to say we're having our picnic right after church. If you didn't bring food, it doesn't matter. Come. If you didn't bring a lawn chair, it doesn't matter. Come. We have uh, chairs over there. If you didn't bring a lawn chair, we do have some chairs over there. We have tables set up. We have tents set up. So even though it is going to be sunny, and I believe when I looked the last time, it said it'd be 78 degrees, 80 degrees, and sunny. So it should be a nice day over there. And like I said, we do have some, we do have tents. So, so there are some, sh there is some shade. There's shade all over in the back by the trees. Um, I know I was reminded today that today is 4-H camp. So between 4-H camp and a lot of things, a lot of the kids aren't there. So we're going to have to make up for that by having fun ourselves, right? So if you have a chance and you can, just come on over right next door to the backyard of the manse. And uh, we'll have a nice picnic. Uh, we'll have a nice picnic over there. And thanks to a whole bunch of people who came this morning to help set up. I will also say that the newsletter is in the back. And so make sure to grab that. Because we tried really hard to have all of June and all of July and most of the events that are happening in August. So you got the whole church calendar, the whole summer uh, calendars in there. There's lots of fun and good things happening um, if you wanted to, to make sure to grab one, or if you don't already get one in an email, and you should, you could still get one anyway. I found that a long time ago, people said to everyone, just get the newsletter online because you're wasting paper. And then I found out that that was the day everybody stopped reading it. So just, we can have hard copies. It's, it's more important that we know what's going on than it is that we don't waste paper. And I waste so much paper every week, so it's, it's okay. I want to bring our, our scripture today, and I think it's important to read this scripture in the context of the first scripture, in the context of the first scripture. And not that this isn't a miracle, and, and not that this isn't a miracle, but what, something that's very important here is this is a sign. So in the book of John, a lot of things are called signs. They're not necessarily called miracles. And that doesn't mean there aren't miracles in the, Bible, in the book of John. But this is signs. And so a lot of folks, when they take the book of John, they divide it up into two different main sections. And I think this is good context for our scripture today. They divide it up in two sections. And the first is the first 12 chapters. And they call that the book of signs. And so in the book of signs... We see all of these signs on which Jesus proves that he is better than, that he is replacing, that he is the fulfillment of these different institutions and festivals of Judaism. So the first 12 books of John, chapters of John, what we get is John proving over and over again that Jesus is replacing the Old Testament signs, Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament finds Jesus is the completion of, or this is the one we've been looking for. And among those 12 chapters, at, we get it divided up even further where we have the institutions of Judaism on which Jesus is either better than or completing. And that first one would be the wedding that we're going to see today, the wedding in Cana. Then we have that Jesus is completing or better or a fulfillment of the temple in Jerusalem. Then rabbis and the teachers of the law. And then the well and even the very place they get sustenance with the well in Samaria. And once we're done with that section of the book of John, it moves on to festivals. And it talks about how Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. How Jesus is the understand, how we are to understand the Passover. How Jesus is the completion of the tabernacle feast. And then, of course, of Hanukkah. And so within the first 12 chapters, 
that we call the book of signs, we get this idea that Jesus is better than Jesus is the completion of, Jesus is the fulfillment of, Jesus is the end goal of the institutions of Judaism and the festivals of Judaism. And now after that, which, I mean, we're not covering more than 12 chapters in John today, but 13 and following, we have the book of glory. So we have the book of signs and the book of glory. So from verse 13 and on, it's basically leading us all up to Easter Sunday, to Resurrection Sunday, and following. And so we have the book of, the book of signs and the book of glory. Now, when we read this book, the book, chapter, chapter of, for today of John, and our story of the wedding feast in Cana, let us keep in mind the rich understanding of weddings, of the festival of the Lamb, that we got just a glimpse of in our first scripture, the scripture in Revelations. I know a lot of times our, my second scripture doesn't, it doesn't always have that much to do with the sermon, but today it really does. Today it really does. So what I would like us to see in this scripture is not just that it's a cool thing Jesus did. Because really, he turned water into wine, and that's neat. But just yesterday, I watched a YouTuber who turned rubber gloves into hot sauce. (laughs) That was pretty impressive. My favorite of his is he turned a roll of toilet paper into moonshine. But anyway... This is a sign even more than a miracle. Now, just to give you a couple of different references before we read the scriptures. First of all, we have these stone jars, these stone jars. Now, a lot of times, I think when we picture this scripture, we think of pitchers, right? We think of pitchers that were probably full of water that the people were drinking. We're picturing small things. We're picturing things like this. We're picturing littler jars. But an important reference here is that these are stone. These are stone jars. And the fact that these are stone jars, the fact that these are large stone jars, makes it almost a certainty that these are the jars that were used for ceremonial washing. These were the hand-washing jars. These were the jars that were used for the Jewish rituals of purification that would have been a part of the worship, a part of a wedding. So these just aren't pitchers. These aren't just pitchers, because then they probably would have been ceramic or clay. But instead, they are stone. And because they are stone, we are to imagine, and we are to take from that reference, that these are the ceremonial, these are the purification jars that would have been used for the purification rituals of Judaism. Now, another part of this that I think is really important that we see is these jars would be giant. These jars would be giant. Now, honestly, I don't know where scholars get this from, but I'm going to trust them that they should be at least 20 gallons. So imagine here, what we're talking about is 120 gallons of wine that Jesus just made, which is more than we're going to have at the picnic. I didn't know if you guys were cool with that yet, so I don't have any wine. (laughs) But this would have been 120 gallons of wine. And even if it's a little smaller, the point being still that these are giant ceremonial vessels that Jesus used, that Jesus transformed into wine. Another addition here is when we talk about wine, when we talk about wine throughout the Old Testament, In continuing, it is usually a reference to abundance. It is usually a reference to restoration, to God's restoration. We can see this in the book of Amos, and we can see this in the book of Hosea, Hosea's chapter 20. And it says, it's one of those scriptures, a lot of scriptures there are in the Old Testament where it talks about how bad Israel is and how much bad stuff is going to happen to Israel. And then once it's done talking about that, It says, but if they repent, and then it talks about the good things and how God will restore them. And it talks about how God will grant them abundance and how God will grant them a restoration and blessing. And when it does that, it talks about wine flowing, an abundance of wine. 
and is this abundance of wine that becomes a reference to God's restoration and God's blessing. And so when we read through this scripture, what I want us to see is a few things. I want us to see that these are signs. It's not wrong to call them miracles, but it is a sign. And in this case, it is a sign pointing to Jesus. It is a sign pointing to Jesus. That Jesus is the restoration. That Jesus is the restoration and blessing. That Jesus is replacing these acts of purification. So it is through Jesus that we are going to be purified. It is through Jesus that we are going to be blessed. It is through Jesus that we are going to be made holy and restored. That's a lot deeper than we tend to go, isn't it, in this scripture? This is a sign. This is a sign that Jesus is taking over, that Jesus is replacing, that Jesus is becoming, that Jesus is fulfilling this act of restoration, of purification, and also of unity. Let's go back to weddings. And it's not that hard to explain weddings. We all have weddings. We've all hopefully been to some weddings. We've seen them. We know what they are, at least. And these weddings would have been even more important back then, with less times for people to get together, for less times for people to fellowship together, for less times for times of abundance. And so God is often spoke of his people as his, group, as his bride. And he is the groom. We see that no, in as clear a way as possible in our book of Revelations, in which we are being married, which we are joining to, which we are being married in the wonderful ceremony into the feast and festival and wedding and marriage with the Lamb, who is, of course, Jesus Christ. And so when we look through this scripture, let's see it for what it is. A reference, a sign to who Jesus is. This is the first time on which Jesus is declaring to the world, to some degree, who he is. So on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mom was there, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. And so look there, that's not just a bummer. That could be seen as a disgrace to the family, that there is no more wine, that they did not have enough, that they did not provide for this system, for this ceremony. This is a disgrace. This is a sign that there is no more glory, there is no more to this Old Testament system. Because of where we are in the history of time, because of where we are in Scripture, the old is no more, the new is brought out, and this is where we shall find fulfillment. Woman, why do you involve me? That's important here. This is not woman. It is formal, though, which is weird. It is, very, it is different that Jesus would identify his mother in that way. But it's formal. It's not rude. Why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. And for most folks, what they say when, when we read that, the explanation is, it's not yet time for him to reveal who he is. Why are you involving me in this? This isn't, it's not time yet. But something, I mean, it's your mama. Because his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Which means she expected him to do something. Nearby stood sticks, six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to his servants, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them with the brim, to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn water knew. 
Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and the cheaper wine after the guests have all drank too much. But you have saved the best until now. Notice here that it probably wasn't in the newspaper. Sorry. It booms out of its way to say that the person who the, that the, the ceremonial, um, what's the word that they use there? That the master of the banquet didn't know where the wine had come from. Only the servants knew. It goes out of its way. And now that doesn't mean the servants didn't tell anybody later. We don't know. But at that moment, the only folks that knew what Jesus had done were the servants. But the master of the banquet experienced, experienced this new wine, experienced this new wine, and it was so good, and it was so different that he knew something was up. And so he called over the bridegroom, and he said, everyone brings out their choice wine first, and the cheaper after the guests had drank too much. But you saved the best until now. And you saved the best until now. Jesus is revealing himself in this wine. And what does it say to us? What does it say to us that Jesus has chosen the very first way, and if we look through the book of John over and over again, he is choosing to reveal who he is through his hospitality. He is choosing to reveal who he is through his hospitality. Through the fact that he is granting this wine. Through the fact that he is saving this ceremony. Through the fact that he is, he is raising up these folks without even drawing that much attention to himself. He is giving the honor to the bridegroom. He is giving his honor to the bridegroom. What does it say to us that the very Lord of this universe is choosing to reveal himself through hospitality? Well, it says to me, that's, that's how we're supposed to reveal the very Lord that's God to others. Not that you can't tell people about Jesus, not that you can't explain things, but we are, we are offering to others this sort of radical hospitality of Jesus. And as you might have saw, or you might not have, through all of, May, through all of June and all of July, we're going to take different scriptures on which Jesus reveals himself, on which Jesus acts, on which Jesus' ministry is dependent upon hospitality, is dependent upon how he treats others, how they are accepted, how they are chosen, how they are involved, how they are brought in. And my hope is that by the end of all this, we get a clear vision of what kind of hospitality, of what it means to be a welcoming Christian, what it means to be a welcoming Christian body. And today, what I think we can see is that we are to offer our best, even when it is not expected even when it is not expected. Jesus could have turned this into Boone's farm. He did not. He turned it into the best. He saved these people, and he did not admit, he did not make it about him. And so Jesus is, can teach us today, when we're talking about hospitality, Jesus can teach us today that we are to offer our best, even when it is not expected. And sometimes that's the best time to offer your best. It's when it's not expected. And second, it's not about us anyway. A long time ago, when I was working at Applebee's, um, there was this couple and this couple, they both worked at Applebee's, and they had two kids, and they were both there, and they were talking about how they really didn't buy each other Christmas presents. They were talking about how they didn't really buy anything for each other, and they barely kind of had enough uh, to buy for their kids. 
And so I thought, because I did have a little extra that day, I thought, well, you know what I'll do? I'll buy a gift card, because if I give her money, she's not going to buy something for herself. So I got a gift card to Kohl's. I got a $50 gift card, which was a lot, because I was working at Applebee's too. And I got a $50 gift card, and I went to the general manager, and I said, can you give this to her? Don't tell them who it's from, because I didn't want to embarrass her, right? I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to do it. I had great motivation. But then she's talking about how wonderful this is, how she got this $50 and how she's going to buy stuff for it. And it said right on it, it had to be for her and for her husband. And she's going to do it and she's going to buy stuff. And she knows that that general manager was who did it. Ooh. I wanted her to think not, not know who did it, not think somebody else did. It was too much for me. And I will admit, I didn't tell her, but I told somebody to tell her that she was wrong. I just, I just ruined it, right? I just ruined it. And I don't think she knew it was me. I, I don't honestly remember that part, but I don't think she remembered it was me. But why couldn't I just left it that way? Here, Jesus, I'm sure eventually the servants told other people and people found out, but, but Jesus left it. Jesus left it, and, and in the end of our story, the person who's getting the credit here, the person that's getting the credit is the master of the banquet. It's not the master of the banquet, excuse me. The person who's getting the credit is the bridegroom. The person that's getting the credit is the bridegroom. Why couldn't I just left it there? So I think our lesson for today is that we are to give our best, even when our best is not expected. And we are to give that glory when we give our best to the bridegroom, to Jesus Christ. Amen? I got one more thing for you, and then we're going to move on. This is less complicated than the last time. I have a challenge. I have a challenge for you guys, and I would love it if you did it. If you don't do it, I mean, you're not getting ice cream. I'm telling you that. I'm not buying nothing. So don't, don't worry about that. But here's what it is. It's, I'm calling it the hospitality challenge. And so what I have here on this card is I have lots of suggestions of ways on which you can be hospitable. Dozens of suggestions of ways in which you could be hospitable. Hospitable. And now to be hospitable, I want us to all remember, is that doesn't just mean hosting parties. That means being a good guest. That means being a good person that comes and helps, a person that cleans up, all of the different aspects that are involved in hospitality. That means experiencing hospitality as well as offering hospitality and accepting hospitality. So, I have a bunch of options. Attend the carrion picnic at the manse. Easy way to get one. You need to get six by the end of the summer. Six, there's one. There's a progressive dinner July 30th, that's two. Sit in a different pew, two weeks in a row. <laughs> and get to know the people around you. Be a greeter. Ten acts of kindness. One-on-one -on -one time with somebody that you never get one-on-one -on -one time with. Invite someone to church or a church function. Do something positive for someone who cannot pay you back. Share something exciting from your life with someone five days in a row. Now, it doesn't have to be the same person. Just share something exciting. Maybe you, today you could share with somebody that you're going to go bonkers with this hospitality challenge. <laughs> now, on the other side, you can pick your own, right? So I have a bunch of activities. Send a card. Go out to coffee. Have a picnic. Do a church activity. Host a game night. Bake a cake. Make a phone call. Share a hobby. Share your interests, right? Host a dinner or lunch. Pizza night. Go bowling. This last one I wanted to describe, it's called a round to it. Around to it. Now, my Uncle Panya, 
he probably said he used to carry around this uh, wooden thing. And so when somebody would say, when I get an around to, when I get around to it, I'll do it. And he would pull it out. And it said, one round to it. <laughs> and he would give it to you. So anyway, that just means it's something. You've got something that you've been meaning to do. Go fishing with your dad. There's something you've been meaning to do when you get around to it. That's that one. And then it has a list of audience. Old friends. Church friends. Not yet church friends. Young parents. And now that's important because a study said that 51% of mothers with young children are desperately lonely. New friends. A neighbor. Shut-ins from church. Shut-ins from your neighborhood. Work buddies. Family. That guy. You know that guy. That guy. Someone who seems lonely. Someone on your mind. If someone's on your mind, that's the Holy Spirit, yo. Sorry. Someone you've lost contact with. Someone you'd like to get know better. I want you to do six of these. It could be from the back. It could be from the front. So, oh, I don't know. Send a card. You get to pick. Mix and match. Send a card to your work buddies. Uh, have a picnic uh, with your neighbors. Does that make sense? Also, you can't do it wrong. There was a lot of stress on the last one. The stress comes from the fact that you have to invite people to do things. And now, I wanted to bring this up. Also, I think, it's, I think we'll really see that, that fellowship and hospitality is how Jesus reveals himself. But the other thing I really want to say is, I mean, the world we live in needs it. The Surgeon General last month declared a loneliness epidemic. A loneliness epidemic. I don't remember all the stats, but they're sad. And they're true. They're true, aren't they? How hard it is to call a friend even nowadays. So I want to encourage us. And I want us to have a, have a sight, a visual, a visual sight of what we're doing here. And so when you do one of these things, we're going to have a bunch of flowers in the back. Don't expect those really nice cutout ones. They're just going to be flowers. And we're going to stick them up on the walls, right? At church. Not with duct tape. And we're going to stick them up. And when you do one, if you come to church on Sunday, stick one up. And this is what I would like. What I would like is at the end of this summer to see hundreds of these things up around the church. And you might say, I don't want to do that because that draws attention to me. But you can put them up whenever you want. Be sneaky. Tell somebody else to do it. The importance of this is here. Someone is saying right now, I ain't going to do this. And when they come in two months from now, and there's 30 or there's 40 on the wall, that will encourage them. And so this is how we can encourage one another. By talking about the things we've done, by talking about the things we've chosen to do, and by putting those things up on the wall. So that makes sense to everybody? Thank you. All right, now that we got all that under control, let's go back to worship. So let's all stand up together and sing our hymn number 505.
see it unless you're one of the folks who serve in communion, if then if you could come forward. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and sit at the table of the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. Then they opened, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites all those who trust in him to share in the feast with which he has prepared. Now here, when we take communion, it is open to all baptized believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We will have a a station for communion over here, a station for communion over there, and one person walking around to those who can't come forward. Take the bread and the cup and then take it. You could take it here up front or you could take it back to your pews. We tend to go down that line and that line. It just makes it easier, keeps us in decent and order. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. We give you thanks that that our Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread. And after giving thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the, after the took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all those who share in this feast, united in ministry in every place. And now let us continue by praying that which you have taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we, as many as we are, are one body. For it is of one loaf that we all partake. When we break the bread, it is the sharing of the body of Christ. And when we share the cup and give thanksgiving over it, it is the sharing of the blood of Christ. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Please come forward when ready.
come to the table of joy. This is God's table, it's not yours or mine. Come to the table of joy. Taste and see. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Oh, taste and see, taste and see the goodness of the Lord, of the Lord. Lord God, we thank you that you have fed us this holy meal, that you've given us this foretaste of what it will one day be like in the kingdom of God, and united us with the saints of the past, the present, and the future. Amen? Let's continue worship of the Lord with the giving of our time, talents, and offerings.
Please join me in the unison prayer of dedication. The Bible tells us to give what we have decided in our hearts to give. May our offering truly be from our hearts. It tells us that our gifts should not be given reluctantly or under compulsion. May our offering stream from our love for God who loves a cheerful giver. Amen. And let's remain standing as we sing our closing hymn today, We Will Go Out With Joy. Prayer request to make sure we share today. Uh, Christy Butcher is having hip surgery on Wednesday. Prayers for Christy. Prayers for the Washington High School baseball team that's in the final four in Akron. Prayers for them. Uh, prayers for, uh, for their victory and safe travel. Nancy Krause is going to have a heart procedure tomorrow. Uh, prayers also for the farmers that they can get some rain. And prayers for Katie Purden, who has an appointment tomorrow with a neurologist. Uh, pray that she can have answers to the leg pain that she's had uh, since Clara's birth. So prayers for all of those. And for now, I hope to see everybody next door. And let's go forth in the love of God, the peace of Christ Jesus, the united power of the Holy Spirit. Amen?